Welcome to our home. Please come in and join us for a little while as we get together in the Word. We're so glad to have you back, those of you that are faithful to listen to the programming of From House to House. We also want to welcome our first-time listeners, and we just pray that this program will uh, be a blessing to you, and you'll want to share with us another time beyond today with our program From House to House. We are in a series that we have called A Royal Wedding Song. This is a 12-part series. And today is going to be lesson number six, and we're going to deal with the king's throne. Now, what this chapter is about, it is about um, the prophecy of one who would come and fulfill all these symbolic things of how the Messiah one day would come and he would be king of kings, Lord of lords. He would have a throne. He would have a royal scepter. He would have a bride. And this is a picture of the king's wedding. They think that very possibly this was written at a time when there was preparation for Solomon's grand wedding, which of course would be a time of excitement, a lot of activity going on, as happens with all uh, fairly sized weddings. And yet, even though this is in the natural and the historical, there is the spiritual implication because it's one of the messianic psalms. It is a prophetic psalm written uh, with a, a poetic a style. And the way we know that this psalm in particular is about Jesus Christ, prophetically speaking, is because it is linked to texts that you will find in your New Testament that refer back to Psalms 45. Ladies, I would encourage you, you should study Psalms 45 more intently on your own, and I think you'll find it'll become one of the delights of your heart, one of your favorite passages in all of your scriptures. I know it has become that for me through many years, and, and there's so much more that is there that I know I've only scratched the surface of what it has to offer. But I'd like to share enough and hope that it would be a stimulant for you to want to get into the Word of God yourself and prayerfully study the Word and let the Lord give you, as it were, heavenly bread, manna from heaven. You know, we need fresh food spiritually that our lives will be stimulated to grow and go on in the things of the Lord. You don't want to arrive to a plateau and become stalemate in the things of God. What keeps your walk with God exciting and alive is your growth. When you cease to grow, then you begin to feel bored and begin to look for other things to occupy your thoughts. And, and I know in my life, all these years from a little child of walking with the Lord, there, there have been those times when I've had to dig in a little more and say, Lord, stir me up again. Challenge me yet to move on, not to, you know, pitch my tent and say, this is it, I've arrived. No, because I haven't arrived and I'm on my way out, not too far from the end of the road. But let me tell you, there's still room for growth until the Lord says that that is it. And I encourage you, seek the face of the Lord in his word, in prayer, in fellowship with the saints. I can't say it enough how important that is so that your life will grow in the Lord and you will find your walk with the Lord will never become what we call here a drag. Okay. All right, ladies, the king's throne. This is occasion of a grand wedding about to take place. And, and the writers are so excited. They've, they've got to describe these different things about the king. They're in awe with this king, even as I'm in awe with my Jesus, who will be crowned king of kings and lord of lords. And we will all throw our simple crowns at his feet someday, won't we, ladies? 
All right, Psalms 45. Turn there, please, in your Bibles. Again, keep that as the basic text because though we move out into other verses, we will be keep uh, referring back to it. Let's read verse 6 of that chapter. Here, through the Spirit of God, the word is spoken, and it's being spoken prophetically to Jesus. It says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom now you say carol how are you sure that is about referring to jesus the savior of our soul okay go to your new testament now hang on to psalms 45 go over to hebrews the first chapter the eighth verse we want to see how in the new testament it reaches way back into the old, into the Psalms, and picks up on this that was prophesied hundreds of years before. And it goes on to say, But as to the Son, S-O-N, capital S-O-N, referring to Jesus, he says to him, referring to Jesus, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever to the ages of the ages, and the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of absolute righteousness, of justice and straight forwardness. So you see the connection? The link between the old and the new, the confirmation that this is prophetical in regards to the Lord Jesus himself. Now, as it speaks of his throne, let's think about the Lord and his throne. Um, the throne symbolizing the seat of authority, of rulership, might, and power, and dominion, of someone that has the last word. Others may have opinion, but when it comes to a king's throne, he has the final and the last word. It's not his advisor's word, it's him making that final, ultimate conclusion. And so, the Lord's seat of authority is seen in the scripture in many places. One of the beautiful views of the Lord being seated on his throne and being a king on a throne, we would read of, ladies, turn with me to Isaiah, the sixth chapter. We'll look at verse one through five, and we'll see this wonderful vision. The, the prophet Isaiah was privileged by God to view. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, this is, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord. Almighty. Here in this scenery, he is seeing the Lord himself seated on this throne. High. He is exalted. The lower parts of his robe is so, so vast that it fills the whole temple. Can you imagine? What a garment. And the room is filled, the throne room is filled with this smoke, the glory cloud of the presence and the might of God. Why? You say, why would the smoke be there? Well, the scripture says our God is a consuming fire. Yes, yes, he has the features described like unto man, but in one sense, our God, the scripture says, he is a consuming fire. There is smoke, there is fire involved in the presence of God. Isaiah saw all that, and he could only cry out, woe is me. I mean, he was, he was terrified at the thought that he, in his physical flesh, had been able to see by the Spirit this heavenly scene that's actually curtained and hid from our eyes 
there in the heavenlies. And he cried out, this is, this is the king. I saw no list, the king. I saw the almighty. Do you know what it means by almighty? One who has all might, all power. That is the God you and I are privileged to know and to serve, to speak to and have him speak to us. Isn't it an awesome thought? To think of us, we creatures here on earth, we little creatures that inhabit this earth, and yet Almighty God, who flung the stars in place, would bother to speak with us and communicate with us, that he would love us and care about us enough to want us to know him as his children, and he be to us as a father. You know, the psalmist in one place said, what is man that thou art even mindful of him when he considered all the works of God's hands, especially in the heavenlies? What is man that you could even be bothered, God, is in essence is what he was saying. So Isaiah saw him up on his throne. So the Lord does have his throne room. Won't it be a day? Won't it be an hour when you and I are privileged to see the Lord up on his throne? Are you looking forward to that day, child of God, when our Lord shall take dominion and rule and reign in heaven and in earth. And his kingdom has come and his will then will be done as it is in heaven. And the Lord told us to pray for that, didn't he? He said, pray when you pray. Not only pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but pray that the kingdom come and that his will would be done on this earth. Instead of the will of Satan, instead of the will of man, the will of God be done on this earth, even as it is in heaven. You know, things in heaven are in order. If I might put it this way, here in America, we say, call the shots. There, the Lord calls the shots. He gives the directions. Someday, when he sets up his kingdom on this earth, he will be the one in charge. There'll be no, there'll be no quibbling. There'll be no question about that. For the Lord will be seated, not only in the heavenlies on the throne, but he will reign and rule out of Jerusalem over all the kingdoms of this world. In Psalms, ladies, we're going to read more text that tells us about our heavenly king and about him being seated up on a throne. The Amplified Version of Psalms 47, verse 7 through 8. Let me read that for you now. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises in a skillful psalm and with understanding. Let me pause right there. And just throw this in. You know, when we sing unto the Lord, we need to do like this says. We need to sing to the Lord, not only with skillful songs, but we need to sing to him with understanding. Sometimes we sing songs, such as in a church service or worship, and we don't even understand what we're singing. It's important that it come from your heart when you sing to the Lord, that you sing with understanding of what you're singing. And, and therefore, you will be edified. It will be glorifying to God, but it'll be also edifying in your own life. I have to say that many of the things I learned about the Lord in my youth came from the songs that we sang, that we sang in church, out of the hymnal and so forth, and the choruses. So much of my, my doctrine, my belief, especially when you used to sing the old, dear old hymn, favorite old hymns, a lot of what you understood <clears throat> about the word of God came right from having sung those songs and you grow into its understanding. And so they're very valuable. I'm a little sad to see that some of our precious hymns are being discarded as, as being, you know, they're too old fashioned. But let me tell you, if there's not much content, if there's not much meat, if there's not much understanding being gained from the worship songs that we sing, then what are we really doing? Are we singing for our own amusement or our own pleasure, or what suits us? Are we really singing to the Lord? Are our children, I'm concerned for the little ones, are they learning to really know the Word of God, the things of God, by some of the songs that they sing? So it's wonderful when you hear the newer music, and it does contain the essence of the Word of God. I just had to throw that in, okay? Anyway, I need to finish the verse, don't I? Verse 8, it goes on to say, God reigns over the nations. God sits upon his holy throne. Yes, 
Yes, the psalmists were writing. The psalmists were writing in Psalms 45, ladies, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking of His holy throne, God being enthroned. There's another text. Let's read while we're in Psalms. Psalms 99, verse 1. I'm going to read the Amplified version on that, and that also speaks of the Lord up on His throne. It says He reigns and and He sits enthroned, and in essence, from this verse, you would glean that that should bring upon us, in a sense, the fear and the awe of God. All right? The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble with reverential fear. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth quake because God reigns. The people should tremble with reverential fear, it says because he's sitting enthroned upon his seated place, even above the cherubim. And this should cause the earth to quake. You know, some people make the Lord so common, they want to make him so relevant, they think, that they bring him down from his high and lofty place. And yet I believe in a warm relationship with the Heavenly Father. And a, and a warm, loving relationship with Jesus Christ, our heavenly bridegroom. But I believe there always should be that backdrop in your heart of the understanding of who God really is, that he is the Lord, the lofty one, that inhabiteth in ter- eternity, the scripture says. And I believe that's in Isaiah. And, and that he is one to be reverentially feared. He is all might. He is all authority. Let's not make him some common Joe. Let's, and no reflection upon those who happen to have the name of Joe. But let's, let's be mindful of who the Lord is. You know, all those in the Bible accounts that had encounters with the Lord, what did they do? They fell on their faces. Some of them dropped almost like dead men in the presence of Almighty God. It was so awesome, so powerful. Their physical flesh could not stand it. And you know, we're going to need to take on our immortality in order to be in the presence of God. It's going to take a new, a new um, physical being. Yes, we may have the same structure, basically, bone structure, whatever, but we're going to have to have flesh up on our bones that, that can handle that light and that power and that presence of being with Almighty God. So let's always realize He is Almighty God upon His throne. He is one to be reverenced and to stand in awe of and have the fear of God and know that the things of God, child of God, they're not something to play with. They're not something to take lightly, something you'll just sit down and go off and do your thing and and just get back to God when you happen to need him because another crisis has occurred in your life. Don't play with the things of God. It's very, very serious. We don't have to be so sober that we're sickening. Yes, we can have joy. We can have some pleasure and so forth. But we need to always handle the things of God with the awe and the fear of God, of a reverence. I wonder... Are you bringing up your children, you that have young children, are you teaching them the reverence for the house of God, the reverence for the holy things of God? Are you, are you allowing them to become profane in your children's eyes? I think it's, it's, it's an important hour for that to be tended to because there's a lot of neglect in that area now that I am seeing in particular. Then I, I want us to go, ladies, over to the last book of your New Testament in the book of Revelation. We're going to look at chapter 6. Let's read verse 14 through 17. I'm going to use the King James Version, which many of you have for that. And it describes a time when there will be the, the opening of the sixth seal upon that sacred book that no one dare open but the Lamb of God, who alone qualified for that responsibility. And there was seen the Holy One seated upon his throne. In Revelation, you'll read how there will be the great white throne judgment. It will be a great throne, not a little throne. It's going to be a great and grand, very impressive, very imposing great throne. Well, let's read that. 6, 14 through 17. And the heaven departed as a scroll, 
when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Think about that. That's not just words. That is telling something that's going to happen. It's going to literally happen. Those heavens are going to separate, rip apart, and they're just going to roll back like you'd roll up an old scroll. Can you imagine when that heaven happens and it tears apart like that? And it says the mountains and the islands are going to be moved out of their place. Whoa, those that dwell on those mountains, those that live on those islands, they're going to wonder what's happening when things start moving, things start shifting, and they're no longer in their place on the map. Verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. I, I would imagine you'd want to hide somewhere when that's happening. The heaven's been ripped out right in front of you in your view. The, the, the ground, the topography that you've been walking on, all of a sudden it starts shifting and moving out of its place. They're going to hide in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, it says. Verse 16, it says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand. Oh, what a day, oh, what a day when that day comes. Whoa, when that which has been familiar all of a sudden is shaken loose and the inhabitants of the earth and wonder what is happening to this world anyway. You know, uh, I live where we have earthquakes and people get pretty distressed when things start shaking and things start falling and collapsing and so forth. It can be very frightening. And yet that will be a drop in the bucket compared when the day of the Lord's wrath and time of accounting comes and men will look for a place. Men that have once thought they were so smart, they were so strong, they were so, as we call it here, macho. They were so manly. And yet when God begins to shake things up and islands are all of a sudden out of place and mountains are out of place, the heaven has been ripped apart to, to be different than what we have known and looked up in the skies and seen before. And they're going to say, this is it. This is what they preached about. This is what we heard prophesied about. They were right. We were wrong. Look, it is coming to pass. And they're going to cry for these rocks to fall on them and, and uh, say, who is going to be able to stand in his presence? Well, but they saw him as one seated on his throne. In other words, he's going to take up his dominion and his power and his might, and nobody will dare arise and want to uh, try and reason anything out with God in that moment because he will be the one with the records and the last word. Well, the psalmist in Psalms 45, ladies, that's what they were seeing, the king how he had a throne and it was forever and ever and a scepter of righteousness. Let's move on. What about his term as king? Well, he's not going to be like a politician. The Lord won't be voted out. Neither will there be any coup d'etats or a sudden overthrow of his government. But as we read in Psalms 90 verse 2, ladies, let's turn there quickly. The King James Version, we're going to read that his kingdom is forever and ever. Psalms 90 verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So his kingdom, his term of leadership and ruling and reigning is from eternity to eternity, for he alone is God. Daniel saw the same truth. Daniel 7, verse 13 through 14 and it reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, on the clouds of heaven came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And there was given him the Messiah dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. Yes, his kingdom will stand. It will not ever be destroyed. God 
is God. What about a scepter? As we looked at Psalms 45, 6, it said, and his scepter was a scepter of righteousness. Now, the scepter was usually a highly or an ornamented, uh, or ornamented rod or staff that would be held by a ruler at his throne, and it would symbolize his authority and his sovereignty. And the Lord's scepter, is, he's, it says here how his scepter is one of righteousness, having to do with a, a, a standard that is just, that is fair. There will be no corruption in the kingdom of God. Won't that be marvelous to know that you're dealt with like as a plumb bob? Everything will be straight. It will be true. There will not be an unequal balance. It will be righteousness. Right acts, right thoughts. That's what will be executed from his throne. Then in Revelation 19, we won't turn there, but it says he's going to rule then with a rod of iron. Oh, as they saw him upon the throne, as they wrote this Psalms 45, by the eyes of the Spirit, someday we shall see the king when he comes. And he's coming in power. All hail that blessed hour. We shall see the king. It says every eye shall see him when he comes. Next program, we're going to talk about the king's, his love and his hate. His love and his hate. God bless you, I pray. Amen. Let flowers bloom, O oh Lord, where tears have fallen. Let our hearts azure then put to you. Reason righteousness, the Lord's own plenty. Program copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34, DVDs, $44, at $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. Original Carol Brooks song album, audio cassettes, $10 each, CDs, $14 each, at $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For orders and support gifts, call toll-free 1-866-777-4748 or call 1-619-445-0751. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the World Wide Web, visit carolbrookministries.com. Email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line numbers are 1-541-592-4539 or 1-619-401-9389. 